everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on the role of IPAC in construction, renovation, and maintenance and design in long-term care settings. My name is Boris Marufov. I am team lead with IPAC Central West Regional Support Team at PHO, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. Before we start with today's presentation, I will mention a few housekeeping items. Zoom allows attendees to have the ability to customize your own view. You can to do so in the right hand corner of your own screen. Please use the Q&A pod if you have any questions during the webinar. We will save questions until the end of presentation. The chat pod was um, disabled to limit any distractions during the presentation. We will be opening the chat to address some of the polling questions. At any point during the session, you experience any technical issues, please email capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. So this session is intended to provide IPAC perspective to construction, renovation, and maintenance in long-term care settings and will not cover subject of access to funding, structure, and administrative work related to this field. We will provide links for you to access those resources, but will not, we will not be able to answer any questions outside of IPAC. So now it is my pleasure to introduce the speakers for today's presentation, Donna Perron and Darius Pajak. Donna Perron is currently an IPAC specialist with Public Health Ontario. Prior to becoming an infection prevention and control specialist, Donna was an IPAC nurse at Ottawa Public Health with the outbreak management team and the IPAC team. Donna also worked as an infection control nurse at the Queensway Carlton Hospital, where she provided IPAC education to all construction trade workers involved in a major capital expansion project assessing IPAC requirements in accordance with the Canadian Safety Standards Guidelines Infection Prevention and Control. Darius Pajak is an IPAC specialist at Public Health Ontario as well. Previously, Darius spent 15 years in both acute care and long-term care settings, focusing on infection prevention and control, as well as in local public health. As part of his portfolio, Darius was responsible for construction and worked closely with both internal stakeholders and contractors to ensure patient safety through all project phases. Darius holds credentials in infection control and epidemiology and public health, and as a former uh, a member of the Provincial Infectious Disease Advisory Committee, PIDAC. So welcome, Donna and Darius. Thank you, boys. Today, the overall objective for today's session is to raise awareness of how infection prevention and control is involved in CRMD in long-term care homes. Also, we hope to ensure everyone is made aware of the best practice resources available through Public Health Ontario. As with all subjects, there is a lot to know so we don't expect you to walk away experts in the field, but you will certainly have a broader idea of what is involved and how to get started. What does CRMD involve? Constru construction, renovation, maintenance, and design has a vast scope, but generally involves three phases, planning, work, commissioning, CRMD is not just about major undertakings like constructing a new facility or adding a wing to a building. It involves all levels of work, including, including things considered pretty mundane, like reconfiguring or painting a room or installing a portable air conditioning unit. Truthfully, all projects can pose a risk and simple work can quickly escalate into something more involved. Although the active work phase may pose the most significant immediate risk, 
as it involves demolition and building strategies of construction, all phases can have dire outcome and lead to infection. Next slide. What does CRMD have to do with IPAC? CRMD and long-term care can pose a significant risk, health infection risk. Infectious agents such as fungi and bacteria, as well as a susceptible population, the elderly, and the high risk setting. Construction activities involve numerous risks. The obvious ones are the workers performing the work, but the occupants of the space are thought most of concern involved with the potential displacement of the, for the duration of the activity. There are numerous risks beyond this that must be considered and planned for. Whether it's fire, an example would be hot works like soldering plumbing, which requires the water to be shut off, or having bypass safety systems such as sprinklers, hard wiring, smoke detectors, and heat detectors, or egress issues such as blocking hallways with supplies or when elevators have been shut down. However, the least thought about risk is to the occupants is the infection risk involved. Three factors make infection a serious consideration during CRMD, including the ones mentioned above. Apart from construction activities itself, design elements such as water fountains and waterfalls and living walls can also pose a health risk to occupants. Next slide. Now that we are all aware of what CRMD involves and the IPAC implica implications of such activities, the next few slides will delve deeper into each of the three phases of CRMD activities to highlight the role IPAC plays. IPAC is a key stakeholder in all phases of CRMD and a representative should be at all meetings to ensure the final project meets best practice requirements for both prevention and controlling infection risk. Mitigating infection risk does not start and end with the safe execution of work. It encompasses the entire process and includes the final layout of the space and its functionality. Public Health Ontario has numerous resources on CRMD, including presentations on each phase. Links to the resources, such as the guide documents and standards, as well as this CRMD checklist. The checklist features on this slide outline the role of the ICP during CRMD. We will briefly highlight each phase, but ref referring this PHO resource is invaluable. Next slide. Planning is the first phase of CRMD we will cover. It relates to not only the layout and the functional plan of the space itself, but it also the phase at which risk, uh, infection risks are identified and mitigation strategies are established. CSA and other standards typically apply to new construction or work involving significant renovations. However, aiming to meet these requirements during any work being undertaken make certain that the space is more able to meet current and future needs. It also is more cost effective when it is included in the work plan. CSA 
has standards on everything from functional requirements of specific settings, such as operating rooms, to construction in healthcare, and on HVAC systems, to name a few. A list of the key resources will be included as a reference slide at the end of the presentation. Next slide. Oh, sorry. The Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care also set out requirements and compliance may be required even for as, as existing facilities. As in the case of Directive 3 and the elimination of three and four bed wards through attrition, which will be touched on later. Another critical role for IPAC during the phase is performing a risk assessment, which we will review in more detail shortly. CSA covers this in their standard Z317.13-17 and again links will be provided at the end of the presentation. Apart from the physical space, it is important that those working in healthcare settings are aware of how they can contribute to infection risk. This is especially important during COVID-19. Not all contractors are familiar with working in healthcare, which is why orientating all incoming staff is so critical. Next slide. During this critical period of the project, it is important not to be complacent since the contractor plans for jobs can change depending on what they encounter, making ongoing engagement critical. This may include, but not limited to, providing immediate feedback to on-site supervisors, raising IPAC gaps and issues to project leads or stakeholder teams. On-site re-education may be necessary and major breaches may require immediate suspension of activities pending corrective action. Next slide. The work phase poses the most critical exposure risk for building occupants as it involves both demolition and construction activities that require that generate significant dust and can lead to stagnant water. Demolition can also reveal existing mold and other hidden risks. During the work phase, the IPAC must ensure compliance with the mitigation strategies established during the planning phase, which is done through auditing. Depending on findings, the approach of the project may need to be adjusted accordingly. Infection surveillance is fundamental to an IPAC program. During periods of CRMD activities, ensuring surveillance is broadened to include infectious agents more frequently encountered during CRMD activities, which were mentioned on slide three. Monitoring for adverse outcomes such as lung and skin infections that can be related to breaches is also important. As certain infections have a delayed onset, especially fungal infections of the skin or lung, it is important to be mindful of this. Prompts such as a clinical presentation or a lab result may require further investigation. Next slide. IPAC involvement at the commissioning phase refers to a systematic verification, documentation, and training and applies to all phases 
of CRMD. This begins at pre-design stage through post-occupancy and operational phase. Commissioning ensures not only that each component of the project meets requirements, but the system itself functions. A system performance can change over time. It's vital that commissioning is ongoing so adjustments can be made to optimize continued operation. Broad stakeholder involvement in CRMD has added benefit to all phases. Having housekeeping or people from facilities department at the table will ensure things like finishes are compliant or are compatible with existing cleaners and disinfectants, and that proposed projects will work with the existing infrastructure. Next slide. A good example of commissioning is a facilities HVAC system. Although it may not represent the latest in available technology, through commissioning, one can verify continued optimal operation and ensure preventative maintenance approach meet best practice. PHO has two documents that help ensure approaches to HVAC or the use of supplementary and or portable cooling system options are carried out safely. The document on the left speaks to HVAC systems, while the one on the right addresses concerns and considerations for fans and other supplemental systems. Considering these requirements will ensure the choice of systems being proposed can be maintained. Additionally, it makes certain that those in charge of operating the facility's physical infrastructure are aware of the work and the opportunity to, to ask questions ensured continued trouble-free functioning. Thank you. Over to you, Darius. Perfect. Thanks so much, Donna. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, so uh, now that we've reviewed the basic phase of CRMD as they relate to the infection control practitioner, uh, we will turn our focus over to assessing the actual risk involved with a particular project and just go over the key concepts within that uh, kind of framework. Uh, so if you recall, the risk assessment takes place during the planning phase, and it uh, allows us to make an informed decision as to how to proceed with the work that's being proposed. Uh, so though it takes, uh, takes during the planning phase, it obviously uh, would be reassessed, which we'll review as well. But once such requirements or expectations are established, uh, you would then want to relay this information to the actual individuals who are carrying out the work. Uh, occasionally, when dealing with contractors, you will be working with uh, contractors who are familiar with healthcare settings and executing work in those settings. Uh, they may already have plans in place to address the risk, but you also want to make sure that you reevaluate your plans to make sure uh, that they did take into account all the different variables within that setting. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so you may still be asking the question, uh, how does IPAC assess risk? Uh, so it definitely seems daunting, but luckily there's a tool that has been developed that takes into consideration two key factors. And these are the factors that make it uh, easy for you to assess this risk. The tool is actually called the Infection Control Risk Assessment Tool, uh, or ECRA for short. Uh, how it works is first we consider the population, the vicinity of the project or setting. So in most of uh, your cases, it would be long-term care homes. And then we consider the nature or extent of the activity that is being proposed. So obviously that's uh, quite a variable. Uh, as you could imagine, the second part relies on having a good understanding of scope and sequence of the work involved. 
And this is obtained during the planning uh, uh, meetings with the contractors and is based on detailed account of the actual steps involved. So talking through what's proposed with the contractors is uh, how you will arrive at uh, making this assessment. Uh, once these factors are identified, a table or matrix, the ECRA tool, uh, will uh, generate one of four preventive measure categories uh, or a combination of those. Uh, the PM or preventive measure category refers to a list of requirements, and these will uh, be implemented during the work phase to make sure all the risks are mitigated uh, so that those occupying adjacent spaces are not placed at the risk. Next slide, please. Uh, so this table shows the various populations or settings within healthcare, uh, referring to them uh, as uh, population risk groups. Uh, so you could see here that risk group one, for example, is a low risk uh, category and includes areas like office areas, whereas the highest risk groups, uh, which would be on the right, uh, would be risk groups four, and those would include areas like dialysis or critical care units. Uh, the list of population risk groups seems a bit daunting again, but if you actually look at it, it's quite simple, especially for long-term care settings. Uh, as you can see under the third column, all work that goes on in long-term care facilities is actually classified as risk group three, uh, which is actually really easy for moving forward with this assessment. Uh, the reason for that is that the geriatric population is actually also a risk group uh, three category. And since residents may be mobile and found in various spaces throughout the long-term care setting, uh, including administrative areas, potentially laundry rooms, dining rooms. Uh, the long-term care setting option in risk group three is actually all encompassing and uh, would be your kind of go-to category. Uh, as you can see from the settings list, this tool is broadly applicable. So uh, all healthcare settings from clinics uh, uh, within the ambulatory care areas to long-term care or DORs would be uh, referencing this table to assess the risk. And it's obviously equally applicable to other settings that are related, such as retirement homes. Next slide, please. Uh, so moving along with the ECRA tool, uh, similar to risk groups, there's also a table to stratify the actual work activity, the CRMD activity type involved. And for this table, we have four categories, list uh, from type A, which is your lowest risk, uh, to type D, which is the highest risk. As you can see, there's examples. So type A would be something simple like an inspection, uh, whereas something in type D or high level would be something that's quite uh, uh, dust generating, such as major demolition or construction activity. Uh, so you want to be mindful of how you categorize this. And obviously, you wouldn't be able to classify things unless you liaise with the contractor through the planning meetings to get a good grasp of what the work is that's involved. Uh, as mentioned earlier, involving IPAC during the planning phase is critical uh, so that these factors can be considered and appropriately managed. Uh, however, again, as projects uh, progress through uh, time, uh, scope and approach may uh, vary just because, as you could imagine, as you do work, you encounter various obstacles, changes, maybe things have to be modified. So as a result, you want to verify that whatever requirements you established at the beginning uh, they are still applicable. If not, you would reassess based on the secret tool and the work involved to make the appropriate decision for continued uh, work that's involved. Uh, however, such installation must first involve electrical work or other wires or other things like accessing ceilings. You wanna make sure that you uh, make those assessments appropriately. Uh, so when you uh, think of SIM upgrades, for example, so window air conditioning units, uh, the automatic reaction for most people would be, this is pretty simple, it's a type A activity, and it shouldn't require much oversight, but realistically, uh, there may be more to it. So uh, to install a window air conditioning unit, you may have to upgrade electrical supply, you may have to modify the window so that the uh, air conditioning unit fits. Uh, so as a result of all this extra work to accommodate the, uh, the original plan, uh, the scope of the work may be greater than anticipated. And that's common for a lot of CRMD projects. Uh, evaluating CRMD projects by considering these two factors is very helpful. And it makes uh, one consider not only the extent of the project, but also its impact overall. So next slide, please. Uh, so the entire matrix that I mentioned, the uh, ECRA, the Infection Control Risk Assessment uh, tool is displayed here. As you could see, the population risk groups are along the left margin of the table, and the CRMD activity type is along the top. 
the preventive measures are in the field of the table and range from PM1 to 4, uh, but could be a combination as you see there. Uh, again, once the PM number is generated, the level of prevention required is outlined in a reference document and describes the equipment and barriers involved, uh, the containment strategies required, and any other relevant uh, considerations that need to be put into place. Uh, each measure builds on the other. Therefore, when an assessment indicates that a PM level four is required, it actually means all other levels are also required. So if you need PM level two, you have to comply with level uh, PM level one and PM level two requirements uh, and so on. Uh, if you look at the table and be told that the long-term care population or geriatric population falls under risk group three, so that's uh, group three on the uh, left column, and go across, you could see that a lot of it, uh, a lot of the work that is involved in long-term care is actually relatively high risk, uh, which uh, makes sense based on the population in this setting. Next slide, please. So in order to identify the specific requirements, so the table that uh, we just looked at will generate those PM level uh, or PM measures, so level one or four. And those could be referenced in various documents. One uh, resource is the one on the right, and it's from Public Health Agency of Canada. And it specifically addresses construction and healthcare facilities and provides a list of specific measures. Uh, the image on the right is one example and looks at PM uh, measure uh, three. It may be hard to see, but things like dust control, ventilation requirements, debris removal, uh, and cleanup, traffic, uh, they're all covered in these documents and specific requirements would be outlined. Uh, so again, uh, when a PM measure three is required, both measures one and three are also required as well as a combination uh, of resources. Next slide, please. Perfect. Uh, so now that we reviewed the core elements of CRMD and IPAC, uh, as well as shared with you the infection control risk assessment tool, uh, we will now highlight some key practice elements, things to consider to make sure your project accounts for all these variables and proceeds smoothly. Next slide. Uh, so as mentioned earlier, the PHO or Public Health Ontario website uh, under the CRMD section has a vast number of resources. Uh, this includes checklists and presentations, uh, everything to guide you through the different pro uh, project phases. Uh, the next couple of slides aim to highlight some of these key things to consider and include things like scope creep. So often when a project uh, uh, is started, it doesn't consider a lot of variables, which is why it's important to have a large group at the table. Uh, the project does get or tends to get bigger with time, which is why the original planning may not accompany that or account for that. And it makes ongoing assessment of the associated risk that much more critical. Uh, containment is another thing to keep in mind and refers to the physical barrier between the work and the unaffected area in the vicinity. So that's something that would be outlined in one of those preventative measure categories. Uh, so that would be uh, one thing to consider. Uh, you wanna make sure that the containment does hold up. So as you can imagine, uh, depending on the scope, nature, the duration of the work, uh, the containment may be breached. So even though you're putting barriers up to contain the work, if the project is uh, there for weeks or months, that containment can be compromised with time. So you wanna make sure that it still holds up and it still actually does uh, what it's supposed to do, which is contain the dust and debris within the workspace. Uh, related to containment is the issue of design uh, designated spaces. Uh, so occasionally contractors may need to work outside of the spaces that are deemed to be the construction site in order to do tie-ins, uh, run wires, make sure that the, uh, place, uh, the space under construction is uh, integrated into the rest of the building. So you want to make sure you're aware of that when that phase occurs and also that you account how that's going to be contained uh, work that is done outside of designated spaces. Next slide, please. Uh, so other common issues and considerations. So one thing to consider uh, is the traffic as well. So how does the contractor enter and exit the space? Uh, how is debris removed? Uh, you obviously don't want to go through a dining facility or have to go through critical spaces to do these tasks because they are uh, contained but still potentially dirty. Uh, cleaning is another challenge. Who will clean and uh, who will clean what? 
Will contractors be responsible for cleaning the space they occupy or the vicinity around the construction site? Or will facilities environment service staff have this task to deal with? Uh, as the proje project does uh, progress, uh, the impacts could be broad, uh, including HVAC systems, electrical systems. So Donna mentioned some uh, impacts uh, these projects could have that are broader than the immediate vicinity where the work is being done. So it's important to account for these and ensure that alternatives are in place. Uh, so for example, if HVAC systems are scheduled to be down, how will residents be kept cool? Uh, if fans are used, for example, do staff have clear guidance and acceptable use and cleaning disinfection requirements are in place? Uh, for fans and other related portable devices, Public Health Ontario does luckily have some resources you could reference. Uh, that will kind of give you some guidance as to how to make sure things are operated safely. Uh, but it's definitely something to consider. Uh, as with any CRMD project, many individuals and organizations will be involved. So this obviously includes municipalities for building permits, uh, may include the Electrical Safety Authority, uh, but others may also uh, need to be notified. Public health, for example, would have to be notified of shutdowns and long-term care settings when it comes to water. Uh, among other things. So, so it's important to be abreast of uh, what is required. Next slide, please. Perfect. Uh, so keeping the safety of residents, staff, and visitors in mind, uh, you also want to account for and address the unique challenges long-term care homes can face, including wandering and exit-seeking behaviors among some residents uh, and mobility issues. So uh, you have to remember that not all contractors may be experienced working in healthcare, so it's important to uh, relay this information. So, uh, so obviously, education for the contractors in terms of expectations from construction side of things is one thing, but ensuring that the contractors are aware of infection control strategies, including hand hygiene and other elements, as well as uh, letting them know what the risks are. So. Uh, designated areas where wandering uh, residents may be uh, occupying. Uh, not only do you want to ensure that the CRMD activity doesn't pose an infection risk here, you also want to make certain uh, that the measures being implemented to mitigate these uh, risks are themselves not creating new additional challenges. Uh, as an example, one of the many strategies that are employed when mitigating dust from construction sites is the use of peel away sticky mats, which some of you may be familiar with. And these are placed at the exit door of the construction site so that any residual dirt or debris is taken off the shoes or boots of uh, contractors who are in those spaces. Uh, so you want to make sure that those mats are there. Uh, however, considering the mobility challenges uh, that some residents may face, having those sticky mats just outside the door could actually result in the residents themselves sticking. It could also cause a trip hazard. So in long-term care settings, often what the, uh, what the solution is, is placing those sticky mats immediately into the containment area, like the ante room, for example. And uh, by doing that, you avoid that risk, the trip hazard that could be generated. Uh, so definitely is something to, uh, to keep in mind. Uh, often certain unique challenges are not apparent, which is why, again, like Donna mentioned, broad stakeholder involvement is actually quite important in planning, uh, just because you want to make sure environment services, facilities, leadership, everyone from those departments is at the table because they may have some considerations which others may not even think of. Uh, so having that broad uh, kind of scope of the uh, impact of the project will ensure that the project is successful. Next slide. Perfect. Uh, so just uh, some points on key strategies for success. Uh, so other key strategies include clearly outlining expectations with contractors. So, uh, so doing the risk assessment speaks to this. Obviously, you're going to outline what preventative measures need to be implemented, uh, but making sure the contractors are fully aware of those is important. Uh, any breaches do require immediate feedback and resolution. Uh, if warranted, work stoppages, as Donna indicated, uh, would need to be implemented to make sure that things are, uh, risks are mitigated until the, uh, the uh, risk is addressed and the work can commence safely. Uh, ensuring facility staff are aware of the work and expectations also ensures that, uh, that everyone's eyes and ears are also part of, the, part of the monitoring process. So this includes frontline staff, environment services staff, 
everyone should be aware what the expectations are, just so if there is a, any breaches, uh, those could be addressed and brought to light. Uh, liaising with cleaning staff, for example, uh, will let you know if containment is working or if contractors are failing to obviously use their sticky mats properly uh, or vacuum or not vacuuming themselves, clean up dust and debris when exiting work sites. Uh, so complaints are certainly a source of feedback, but again, uh, setting expectations and verifying compliance ahead of any such issues is obviously prefer preferred uh, to uh, mitigate any risk that could be involved with uh, such breaches. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, so planning for CRMD activity can be, uh, can be a very involved process, uh, especially during a pandemic, the demand is that much greater. Uh, facilities must ensure that they uh, reference current ministry directives. So obviously there's changes, we're in uh, step two. Uh, so you wanna make sure that you're aware of what's happening so you could better guide uh, contractors who are accessing your facilities. Uh, you wanna consult with local public health and guidance as to the current situations, current restrictions, and any potential requirements that may be needed in advance of such contractors entering your facility. Uh, things to consider include uh, access. So the key here is to ensure that everyone enters the facility to designated spaces. Uh, so the contractors are screened for symptoms, uh, that additional contractors don't actually enter through other avenues. So there's always the potential that when contractors are there, they have access to loading docks, they have access to backdoors for loading supplies. Uh, so you wouldn't want other contractors, subcontractors to enter to undesignated spaces where they avoid screening. You wanna make sure you're aware who's in the facility uh, from uh, various reasons. Obviously screening is one contact tracing. So you wanna make sure you have a good idea of what's going on from that perspective. Uh, masking and hand hygiene compliance are other considerations. Uh, these warrant IPAC training, for example, uh, for incoming crews and verifying practices throughout audits. So obviously there's expectations for hand hygiene, mask wearing, especially if the crew has to come to the common area. Ideally, the construction site is outward facing where the contractors could enter the construction site directly from the outside. Uh, often not realistic if it's a higher floor or something internal to the, uh, to the organization. Uh, so you would have to have contractors going through the halls. So ensuring they're aware of mask use and compliance, hand hygiene compliance. And also uh, there should be PP stations set, outside of, set up outside of the construction site uh, just because when contractors are finished with whatever work they're doing in their space and are entering back into the common area where residents may be uh, walking through the halls, you want to make sure those contractors have a clean mask, do their hand hygiene before rejoining uh, the general population to avert any uh, infection risk involved there. And again, audits very important for compliance with construction level activity, as well as PPE use and uh, hand hygiene, all those elements. You want to make sure that you uh, keep aware. Next slide, please. Uh, so other things to include. So there's obviously a lot of things to consider. Uh, having, again, uh, multiple stakeholders will uh, enrich kind of the conversation. Uh, planning for potential snags, building and project schedule flexibility is very important. Uh, having the ability to pivot. So uh, what if an outbreak is declared? What will happen? Will the entire work be delayed or are contractors able to have a plan B uh, for such potential eventualities where they could work elsewhere, not delaying the project and make sure that they still uh, hit the target completion date? Uh, there could also be outbreaks within the crew as well. So construction site uh, outbreaks have occurred. Uh, there's guidance for that as well through the Ministry of Labor, the public health units. Uh, so being mindful of that as well is very important uh, so that the project does end on time. Uh, in an effort to reduce interactions between work crew, uh, crews and the population at the home, uh, you also wanna consider things like lunch and break spaces, where will this occur? Uh, smoking areas, uh, restroom access, storage is always a big factor. So where's, uh, where are items gonna be stored, whether they're tools or things for staging of the project. Uh, if you're getting a, a truckload of 50 air conditioner units, where are those gonna be stored and our contractors gonna have access to those spaces. So all things that need to be considered to uh, prevent uh, any potential snags and pitfalls that could result. Next slide, please. 
Uh, so now that we covered a lot of the basics, including, go, uh, including going over some strategies for ensuring the projects are successful, uh, we'll go over a couple of project examples just to reiterate some key points. Next slide. And so the first example is air conditioning system upgrading. And uh, the reason for that is that there is a big push for ensuring cooling in, in long-term care homes. Uh, before we begin, though, it'd be a good idea to go through a few polling questions just to get an idea of this current state of air conditioning at your uh, facilities, as well as what the plans are for going forward and upgrading. Uh, so question number one, do you plan on upgrading or installing air conditioning at your facility? waiting for the results. Perfect. Uh, so about half and half. Uh, so uh, I'm assuming you either have uh, systems in place, uh, you may not be uh, uh, doing upgrades, or maybe your, your home doesn't have the capacity. So we mentioned earlier, there's the whole issue about infrastructure and if it's compatible. Uh, so again, installing an air conditioning window, window unit seems very easy, uh, but if that requires a lot of background work in order for that to even be feasible, uh, then definitely it's not an option a lot of places could take. So, so now question number two. Uh, so if yes, uh, have you had your facility assessed to determine system capacity and requirements? So that uh, kind of leads off the comments I just made uh, to see if your, if your home is capable of doing those upgrades that are proposed. Uh, so a lot of places are doing assessments, which is great because that's really important and integral to the planning phase of the work. Because uh, obviously you want to know what you're working with, what the scope of the involved project work is to see uh, what is feasible, how broadly you could uh, air condition the facility, as well as what the construction type activity would be involved. So definitely very important to get uh, that information. And then question number three. Uh, so for those who have had their facility assessed, what issues have been identified, if any? Uh, so ranging from no issues to deficiencies with electrical, uh, system capacity issues, window openings too small. And some of these have solutions. So window openings too small, there's units that could be uh, vented through smaller openings, but a lot of them may require reservoirs to be uh, used for uh, capturing the condensate and that leads to having to manage water, stagnant water in rooms. So there's a lot of issues with these uh, alternative approaches potentially. So. Perfect. Uh, so half the homes seem to have no issues, which is great to hear, but uh, that also leaves a huge portion half with issues. So electrical deficiencies, window openings, issues with layout. So these are all considerations and they may, may uh, mean extensive work involved to get these projects underway, or maybe uh, nothing is happening just because uh, it's either cost prohibitive uh, or the, uh, the uh, project is too involved and the scope can't be achieved with the current occupancy, for example. And then our last uh, question. So if you are unable to proceed with upgrades of air conditioning systems, what are your plans? So only air conditioned common spaces, defer to another year, use fans or other. So we'll open up the chat box for that other question or other answer and feel free to uh, type in what that may be. So I see in the other section capacity of chillers, duct work, Perfect. And overall, so only conditioning common areas. So most, a lot of the homes uh, are considering that as the only option. 
so obviously working in common areas to install air conditioning units does have an impact. Just uh, common areas are being taken out of uh, commission and uh, need to be worked on. And obviously it's in the open, it's not, it's not contained for an individual room. Uh, differing to another year, about 19% using fans. So uh, again, making sure that there's policies and protocols in place on safe use of, the, of such portable devices. And again, Public Health Ontario does have the resources you could reference to ensure that is done uh, safely. And I would just have another quick check for the chat box just to see if there's any other. That's fine, perfect. Okay. Uh, so as mentioned earlier, small projects do have a tendency to get bigger as scope is frequently underestimated. Uh, this has many implications, so mentioned costs, time to completion, and now obviously as you're aware, infection risk is another big consideration. Uh, IPAC involvement in all phases of CRMD is critical. Uh, referencing Public Health Ontario's ICP checklist is a really good resource. Uh, it's very, uh, very wholesome in terms of what the, it considers, and it's a nice guide to kind of prompt the ICP as to what needs to be addressed. And as you could see with this project example, VHVAC, the planning for such work is potentially quite involved, and it does need to, to consider the actual work involved. Right, next slide, please. Perfect. Uh, so here you could see uh, some uh, some things to consider, uh, which we mentioned in some of the polling questions. Uh, will there be shutdowns? What's the nature of the proposed work? So all these things need to be looked at to ensure that the work is being uh, carried out safely and that it does consider all these uh, different elements. So again, planning is very important uh, in this and stakeholder engagement is very critical. Next slide. Uh, so our second example uh, is uh, looking at the ministry directive number three. And as Ma Donna mentioned earlier, the elimination of three and four bedrooms to attrition uh, once they become uh, vacated. Uh, so we mentioned that the CRMD is quite broad. So all related activity, no matter how trivial it may appear, should be reviewed through an IPAC lens. Uh, so facility approach to dealing with this uh, eventuality uh, with the elimination of beds may be simple. So it may just not be filling those spaces once they're vacated and reconfiguring the room so that the space is maximized between the, those residents that remain. Uh, the other option if resources are permitted uh, then uh, would be to restructure, reconfigure the room if the size is adequate uh, to uh, ensure that uh, there is not a significant reduction in occupancy. Uh, regardless of approach, planning is uh, very important once again, because uh, you want to make sure that the space remains functional and is uh, uh, meeting all the requirements that are set in CSA standards. Uh, simple changes may only require that staff, ensure, that staff ensure that hand hygiene product is still at point of care and that the general flow of the room is maintained and it's safe. Uh, but obviously, if there are significant changes like constructing walls, you want to make sure that you meet CSA requirements in terms of spacing, the layout, HVAC requirements. Uh, and it seems pretty simple, but even from personal experience, uh, being involved in various projects, uh, there's been a lot of issues uh, as a result where there isn't consideration given. Uh, walls are put up, not giving regard to the HVAC distribution. So some rooms have all the supply air, whereas other rooms only have the return, return air. Uh, which affects obviously ventilation, those spaces. Uh, contractors I've uh, worked with have put up walls or taken down walls and covered or eliminated light switches. So light switches remain on constantly uh, with no uh, access to turning them off. So even though it seems, uh, seems like it couldn't happen, it obviously does and, and must be considered uh, when taking on these projects. So very important to, uh, to consider these, uh, these things. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the next couple of slides, uh, primary just uh, list all the references and key resources that we do have through Public Health Ontario uh, and obviously beyond with CSA and others. Uh, all of these things will give you assistance in uh, dealing with CRMD projects and uh, make sure that they are carried out safely uh, on time and hopefully uh, without any infection control implications. Uh, so I do want to just uh, thank everyone for listening and taking the time. And now we'll go back to boys.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Darius and Donna. Uh, it was very informative. Um, and uh, we will now move on to some uh, Q&A pod to address some of your questions. Please continue to enter these into the pod if you have not already done, to, and uh, there is opportunity to do so now. And uh, let me see if um, uh, what we have in there. So uh, there are several questions about uh, availability of uh, the presentation and the recording. So I will wrap all, all of those into one answer saying that in, in a couple of weeks, we will be posting the recording of this session, uh, which is being recorded uh, right now, and the presentations in, in our website, and it was uh, shared in uh, the answered uh, section of your uh, Q&A uh, pod, so you can see that. So that is a, a common answer for all those um, uh, questions. And uh, the next, um, uh, there is a question from Joanne, um, asking, uh, is the local public health unit inspector involved in all construction projects from the onset as well as the city inspectors? Uh, maybe Donna, can you address this uh, please? Um, so sure, so from my experience, no, the health inspector, unless there is a current outbreak or there's an infectious agent that has been identified, they may check with the home where the, such as an aspergillus or a legionella, they will, a health inspector will, um, uh, may go and visit the home. Um, but the Ministry of um, uh, uh, Labour uh, does have uh, um, inspectors that, that are trained um, um, to a degree on infectious uh, infection control. Um, and so I know that they have uh, been on site and have uh, um, uh, put measures into or requested or required. Um, but uh, that is from my personal experience that health inspectors have not done um, on site inspections for uh, uh, construction. Darius, do you have anything to add to that? For sure. Uh, it uh, sort of varies on scope. So we did mention the presentation, there is a requirement to notify public health with water shutdowns. Uh, the other uh, issue would be food premises regulations. So the home would have a kitchen. So if there is work involving the kitchen, the public health and fire department should be notified of that. Uh, otherwise, the primary concern is uh, the work being done in the home during this period. Obviously, with COVID-19, you want to make sure that all the current guidelines and recommendations from public health uh, are in place uh, and that you're aware of what the latest uh, requirements are to the public health unit. Uh, that will just ensure that you're executing the work in a safe manner. Okay, thank you. And uh, there is a question from Madeline um, for small facilities. Uh, it would be good to have a construction renovation companies ensure their workers have received the appropriate IPAC training in advance with the facility ICP orienting, orienting them to the uh, specifics of the site. So can you recommend some resources we can direct the companies to external training in IPAC and CRMD? Sure. So, uh, so there are various organizations that do train contractors. Uh, there's a lot of aspects to CRMD activities. So there is training in, in mold abatement. There's training in overall construction safety from a healthcare perspective. Uh, so it's hard to list them all. We definitely could provide the resources as to what is there, including uh, to IPA Canada, those resources may be available. Uh, but uh, just overall, it is a good idea that we, what Madeline mentioned is to ensure that when you are dealing with contractors, I mean, it may not always be feasible, is that you uh, request as part of the uh, tender of the project that they do have training in place uh, that just verifies that the contractors that do take uh, healthcare safety uh, in, into consideration when executing their work and that they've gone through some sort of training course uh, to ensure that they are well versed on construction these settings. Okay, thank you. Um, the next is I'm not sure if uh, we can address that uh, maybe very quickly. Some rationale behind the why does the ministry require eliminating three uh, or four uh, bedrooms? 
Sure, I, I would uh, suspect that's a ministry level question and decision in terms of why a lot of it would uh, be based on spacing requirements. Uh, and I think uh, the COVID-19 outbreak has showed us that, that those spaces do have a tendency to have higher rates of infection as a result of those pro uh, close proximities between bed spaces. Uh, so that's one rationale, but uh, it is a ministry level decision. So it'd be best uh, for the ministry to address it. Thank you. And uh, the next will directives and education session for forthcoming uh, uh, session uh, B forthcoming for acute care sector. So we don't know um, at this stage. Um, the, the next, uh, can you provide examples of construction infection surveillance? Is it best to be active or passive from Berlin? Uh, so would be part of your overall surveillance strategy. So every uh, facility, healthcare facility should have an active infection surveillance program in place. And it does include both elements of active and passive. Uh, but what you do want to make sure is that you broader it so you consider anything construction related. Uh, the key with construction related infections, as Donna mentioned in her slides, uh, is that uh, a lot of these uh, infections could be delayed, which is the case with a lot of fungal infections. Uh, so by the time infections do come up, the contractors and the work may be completed, contractors may be long gone. Uh, so you also want to make sure that you kind of uh, frame that infection you identify in terms of the time, place, uh, the work that was uh, involved, uh, and also what the microbiological finding is to see if it is possibly related. Uh, but I would say uh, both passive and active approaches would be ideal, uh, just to ensure that you uh, capture whatever uh, is potentially brewing. Okay, thank you very much. And with the, our, our time is uh, almost over. So at this stage, um, please uh, continue and, and send. We will not be able to answer all the questions. And at the, the last slide was shared with you um, all the contact information of uh, uh, the regional offices uh, of PHO to, uh, to answer your IPAC related questions. So as we wrap up today's session, I would like to thank Donna and Darius for the presenting and please send uh, any questions uh, to, uh, you know, contacts, as I said. And uh, I would also like to thank everyone who joined for uh, today's webinar. It is great to see such a strong virtual participation during such a challenging time for uh, all of us in healthcare, specifically professionals to um, uh, access past presentations and view confirmed upcoming sessions, please visit the PHO website, um, head to uh, education and events and click on presentations. Lastly, you can expect to receive the brief and anonymous survey for today's session shortly. Please try to complete this to help us uh, improve our programming. And uh, thank you very much and have a uh, wonderful day. Mm -hmm.